the witch hunt against the left in the party has claimed a leading parliamentary ally of Jeremy Corbyn. We are in the middle of another attempted coup, this time possibly a slow one, but it is gathering force. And the false and exaggerated allegations of anti-Semitism in the party will not stop unless and until Jeremy is either toppled or, and I think this is the main aim of the, uh, the coup, taken prisoner by the right of the party. They've tried to topple him and they can't do it because they don't have the numbers under the electoral system. So they're trying to render him powerless. This coup is about re-establishing the primacy of the Parliamentary Labour Party mm -hmm. against us, mm -hmm. the membership. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, it's a coup supported by sections of the left itself. In my opinion, including the leadership of Momentum. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris has been suspended because he is one of the few Labour MPs to speak out against the smears. Because he booked a room in Parliament to show the film Witch Hunt, about the witch hunt in the party and the struggle of the Palestinians for justice. And for what he said at a momentum meeting in Sheffield. And as an act of elementary solidarity, I will now repeat those words. So if anyone is here from the Compliance Unit or Legal and Governance, whether it's called, <laughs> turn your recorder on now. Speaking of the allegations, that the party is overrun by anti-Semitism, he said, quote, the party that has done more to stand up to racism is now being demonised as a racist, bigoted party. I've got to say, I think our party's response has been partly responsible for that because, in my opinion, we've backed off too much. We've given too much ground, we've been too apologetic, We've, we have done more to address the scourge of anti-Semitism than any other political party. Close quotes. Now, that's what he's been suspended for. My only, my only criticism is just that he was stating the bleeding obvious. Now, this speech came after General Secretary Jenny Formby released deep data about how the party has dealt with these allegations of anti-Semitism. I quote here from an article in briefing, those who have got it will read it. Jenny Formby's data, says the article, confirms that the grounds for the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn and Labour have indeed been grossly exaggerated and in some cases fabricated. Over the last 10 months, there were 1,106 referrals of anti-Semitism allegations. 433 of these had nothing to do with party members, leaving 673 to be investigated. 220 of those were dismissed entirely for lack of evidence. This left 453 cases. 453 is 0.08 of the party's 540,000 members, about 1 12th of 1%. 96 of these resulted in suspensions, that's one hundredth of one percent of members. There were twelve expulsions. That's one five hundredth of one percent of members. Margaret Hodge was informed by Jenny Formby that of the two hundred dossiers she had submitted, only twenty were found to be by Labour Party members. Mm. In other words, her allegations of anti-Semitism in the party had been exaggerated tenfold. And single-handedly, she accounted for approaching one-fifth of all referrals. Now, let's be very clear, for the avoidance any doubt, one case of anti-Semitism in the party is one too many. But to quote from the article again, this is not a wave, it is not even a ripple. In our Thanet and Sandwich Labour Party Facebook page, one of our comrades, by no means on the left, said this. Got to hand it to the Labour Party. Every time I think they can't get more ridiculous, they manage to surprise me. What seems to be happening now is that it's been considered anti-Semitic, not just to say it's uh, anti-Semitic things yourself, but to disagree with the party about ac how accusations of anti-Semitism in others should be handled. It's, quotes meta-anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism you commit by discussing anti-Semitism wrongly. <laughs>
The charge against Williamson was led by Tom Watson, deputy leader, self-appointed overseer of complaints of anti-Semitism in the party. He's extremely unconcerned when it comes to racism against black people and Muslims. He went along with all New Labour's anti-terrorism and prevent measures, and he abstained on Theresa May's 2014 Immigration Act, which introduced the hostile environment policy, which led to the deportation of huge numbers of black people. So much for his anti-racist credentials. And then on Monday, we hear Siobhan McDonough MP coming out with a familiar trope. She faces no sanction. Listen to this. When asked if the Labour Party was taking anti-Semitism seriously, she replied, I'm not sure that some people in the Labour Party can take anti-Semitism seriously because it's very much part of their politics, of hard-left politics, to be against capitalists and to see Jewish people as the financiers of capital. She's suggesting that all or many Labour Party members believe that the banks are controlled by Jews. Classic protocols of, of, of the Elders of Zion territory. She draws the conclusion, therefore, that Labour's critique of the financial casino activities that almost crashed the world economy is motivated by anti-Semitism. She owes us, the tens and hundreds of thousands of members who are campaigning for effective oversight of the banks, a speedy and humble apology. Mm -hmm. Fighting for a, a fairer society and against equality and austerity is not a symptom of anti-Semitism. She cannot be allowed to silence criticism of capitalism within a socialist party. Yeah. And Margaret Hodge, mm -hmm. Dame Margaret, mm -hmm. she who pandered to the BMP um, year, a few years back uh, when she advocated priority in housing for the indigenous population over and above those of migrants. Is this anti-racism? And in the last couple of days, I've heard that two comrades of mine are now being criticised for anti-Semitism. One, Darren Williams, mm -hmm. uh, part of the left of the NEC, yeah. someone I've known for 20 years, a great comrade. And now George Burnett, union activist in, in, um, in unison. And I remember three, four years ago, anyone there at the Battle of Dover when we were fighting the fascists, one of the most frightening days of my life when they were throwing bricks at us. Who was there side by side with me? George Burnett. And where were his detractors? Nowhere to be seen. Now, I know what anti-Semitism is, and I don't like being lectured by those who seek to proclaim themselves as representatives of the Jewish community. I won't accept lectures on anti-Semitism from those who have neither experienced it or fought it. Now, I'm not going to exaggerate my experience. I have not suffered discrimination or exclusion in the way that black and Asian people have and still do. But I did suffer prejudice. How many times as a child was I told that Hitler should have finished the job and sent the Jews to the gas chambers? I was told that when I was six. I was told that you Jews killed our Jesus and laughed at when I tried to patiently explain that Jesus was a Jewish leader. Yes, I was already a political activist at the age of six. <laughs> How many times have I had to walk out of football grounds when fans of my team, I'm an out West Ham fan, so take it or leave it, when fans of my team were singing, I've never felt more like gassing the Jews. Now, my experience of anti-Semitism, when I was young especially, made me feel an outsider, a feeling I've never lost. I also learned lessons from my father about fighting the fascists at Cable Street in the east uh, end of London in the 1930s. How the Jewish East End, in alliance with the Dockers and other sections of the Labour movement, stopped Mosley's fascist thugs. And these experiences and learning about the traditions of Jewish socialism led me into anti-racist struggles, made me a socialist internationalist, and at the age of 19, 50 years ago, I joined the party. And I've been a member of eight different constituency parties, and my experience over half a century is that I've hardly ever encountered anti-Semitism in the party. Indeed, the party has been a safe haven for me. It's been a refuge. I've come across anti-Semitism once directly in the party, in Hackney North, when an idiot came out with anti-Semitic bill. The secretary, smoke coming out of her ears, called for his eviction from the meeting. Passed unanimously, didn't even have the nous to vote against it, and he was never seen again. Now, I'm sensitive to anti-Semitism. I have a sick sense about it. 
I know what it is, and I also know what it isn't. So what is the problem? There was no problem until that lifelong anti-racist Jeremy Corbyn became leader. Just remember who was the previous leader. His name was Ed Miliband. He was Jewish. And who was the main challenger? His brother, David, also Jewish. Clearly all those anti-Semites in the party were doing rather a poor job. He became leader, Jeremy, and it all started. He was a threat. A threat, of course, to the right wing of the party because he was a socialist. And because of his pro-Palestinian record, a threat to supporters of the State of Israel. Jeremy became leader and all of a sudden, the party has a major problem with anti-Semitism. Now look, let's be clear, the Labour Party is part of society. In my opinion, it's the best part of society. But it's part of society nonetheless. And there are examples, of course, of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And no one should deny it. But from my experience, it is underrepresented in the party, just as you would expect, and just as the data that Jenny Formby uh, gave out reveals. And what we've seen is a pincer attack, with sections of the right wing joining up with pro-Israel supporters and manufacturing a crisis that largely does not exist. And they do it with the simple means of conflating anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. And a lot of this has been done with the support of the Jewish Labour Movement and affiliated organisations of the party that is Zionist in its constitution and supports Israel. So who are the main victims of this? Firstly, Jews themselves. Anti-Zionist Jews, such as Moshe Machaba, renowned 82-year-old Israeli professor of philosophy. Glyn Secker, the JVL secretary, a lifelong anti-racist. Both of those were suspended and lifted within a few days. And also my partner, Jackie Walker, suspended for two and a half years, about to face charges on the 26th and 27th March and, believe you me, without doubt, facing expulsion. So firstly, it's the Jews. Secondly, black anti-racist activists like Mark Wadsworth, expelled, and Jackie again. And thirdly, probably the best anti-racist leader this party has ever produced, Ken Livingstone, forced out for daring to examine the history of the Havara Agreement in the 1930s, by which some Zionist organisations played a role in breaking the anti-Hitler trade boycott that threatened to bring the new Nazi government to its knees. And now, Chris Williams. And why does this matter? Because it is used to undermine the best party, this, uh, the best leader this party has ever had. Because it is a diversion from the fight against the Tories and their austerity programme because it's used to conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism and silence criticism of the State of Israel and Palestinian rights and close down discussion on key historical issues. Comrades don't have to agree with me on any of this, but let's have the discussion and let's not make it out of bounds. Because it separates anti-Semitism from all other forms of racism and obscures the racism against black and Asian people which structurally excludes them from power in society and within our party. Because it's a slur on our, my party, our party, which has a proud record of fighting all forms of racism. And above all, as someone who has experienced anti-Semitism, it hinders the fight against anti-Semitism itself. This is particularly odious, the way false allegations of anti-Semitism are being used for factional interest an abuse of the memory of all victims of anti-Semitism and racism. And if we don't put an end to this, it will come back to haunt us. Now, it's argued, say, say some, that to criticise the Jewish state is to attack a fundamental part of Jewish identity. With some people, that's true. But what if, like me, it's not part of your identity? Let me say what happened at the Jewish Labour Movement-led training session at the 2016 Labour Conference, which led to Jackie Walker's suspension. It wasn't Jackie who made the sharpest, sharpest intervention at that session. It was me. The trainer said it was OK for people to criticise the Israeli government, but not acceptable to challenge the legitimacy of the Jewish state of Israel. So I said, and again, anyone with a hotline to the legal and government, turn your recorder on. I said, as an internationalist Jew, I oppose the Jewish state 
because under the law of return, it gave me a greater right to live in Israel than those Palestinians who were addicted, dispossessed, and ethnically cleansed. This was not just a criticism of the current right-wing extremist government of Israel. It was a criticism of the fundamentals of the state itself, as these crimes were committed by the founding fathers of the state, who were, of course, Labour Zionists. Was this, I asked the trainer, in your eyes, I said to him, a legitimate criticism, or does it come within your definition of anti-Semitism? <coughs> he couldn't answer. He couldn't deal with what was behind my question, that many... Jewish socialists cannot support Israel as it is presently formed because it is a racist state based on the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians rather than a state for its citizens. Jackie was singled out, not me, though my challenge was greater. I wonder why. Having witnessed the racist abuse to which he has been subjected, I can only guess. Now they have tried to silence us and, the, and they have failed. The level of support for the resolution on Palestine at last year's conference is testimony to that. The opposition to the State of Israel, support for the boycott, divestment, uh, divestment move, boycott movement internationally is growing. And it is growing in the Labour Party too, as the Jewish Voice for Labour, the non-Zionist Jewish organisation, is beginning to grow. What happened in September 2015 when Jeremy won the leadership was a shifting of the tectonic plates. Just remember where we are where we were. Ed Miliband had lost the May 2015 election. New Labour knives were out. The candidates to replace him were so awful that some in briefing, one actually, even suggested we should support Andy Burnham. And then, at a campaign group meeting in Parliament, they went through the options for the left. Some unnamed genius suggested Jeremy Corbyn. He was seen as such a no-hoper that sufficient centre and right MPs in the parliamentary party were persuaded to nominate him, and with seconds to spare, he scraped onto the ballot paper. One of those was Margaret Beckett. Later, in a moment of regret, she referred to herself as a moron. <laughs> she was right. It was, but it was clear to many of us that Jer if Jeremy got onto the ballot paper, he would be a strong candidate. I remember saying this at a meeting in Ramsgate a couple of days before the close of nominations. I was laughed at. But why was there this change? In part, the morons had forgotten the change in the electoral system for electing the Labour leader, passed after Miliband's Collins review. Now it was one member, one vote. No electoral college, no votes for MPs, and now votes for registered supporters. It was one member, one vote for affiliated trade union members as well. So confident were the right, so dismissive of the left, that they'd forgotten the words of Richard Crossman over 50 years ago, when he said that the right keeps control of the Labour Party in two ways. The independence of the parliamentary party and the trade union bloc vote was what kept them in power. But it wasn't just a historical accident, though it was in part, that won it for Jeremy. Something strange was happening outside. In Greece, the rise of Syriza. In Spain, Podemos. In the United States, the rise of Bernie Sanders. The years of stability had been broken by the economic crisis of 2008. Now, the old Marxist in me tells me that it's conditions that determine consciousness. Just as the First World War was the precondition for the Russian Revolution, the 1929 crash, the precondition for Hitler's rise to power. So too at a lower level, no doubt for the moment, the 2008 economic crash undermined the stability that sustained new Labour and moderate bourgeois governments and brought in its wake the radical movements of left and the populist movements of the right. That had an economic foundation. And once the morons gave us the opening, it was there for the taking. And we were bold and we seized the moment. I have many happy memories of putting out our stall in Broadstairs seafront with our application forms for register supporters. Mm. I remember it well, some of our stall holders' um, um, experience told me how to do it. Vote Jeremy Corbyn for Labour leader, three pound a vote. And they came, <laughs> and they came and they voted, and the other candidates suddenly had feet of clay. And a similar thing happened with the general election 2017. Jeremy surrounded by a hostile parliamentary party which had tried to mount a coup against him. 
somehow surviving, looking weak. Then another bold move, the manifesto, far to the left of anything we could have anticipated. For the many, not the few. Battle joined. This time it was the Tories, not new Labour, with feet of clay. The outcome was Jeremy Stronger, a Corbyn government in waiting. A minority Tory government sustained by the DUP, almost broken by the election campaign in political meltdown. Their manifested promises are dead. Their Tory red, white and blue Brexit is dead. A weak Tory government that will replace its leader before the next election. We have destroyed the argument from all sections of the right that a radical programme is incompatible with electoral success. Now, when Jeremy won the leadership, the odds were massively, and are massively, against us. We were fighting. Just think of all the enemies. One, the state, with veiled threats by generals to overturn a democratically elected Labour government. The media, with relentless attacks and ridicule. The Tories, the undemocratic structures and rules of our own party, with the right-wing dominated compliance unit, another party within a party, being used to suspend hundreds of Corbyn supporters. Yeah. And all this in the context of a vote on Brexit that had put Labour between a rock and a hard place and the near death of Labour Scotland that would take years to recover from yes. whoever was Labour leader. And the PLP refusing shamefully to accept the party's overwhelming verdict, briefing against Jeremy, forcing a second election uh, leadership contact test, acting as a party within a party, fearing a, Tory, a, a Corbyn government uh, more than a, another Tory government. And that is the case, with, mm. in my opinion, mm. with a significant section mm. of the parliamentary party.